requested that his mother bring him um, to the sheriff or to the to police department the following day. And did they? Did his mother agree to do that? Yes. And having fixed the situation of no ride, did the defendant agree to come speak? Yes. Um, now you just referenced the police department. Um, which the police police department did you agree to meet at? The Osceola Police Department. Um, and um, did he show up the next day? He did. That date of that that he showed up at the police department, what was that date? The 22nd of February 2017. At the time that you conducted this interview with the defendant on February 22nd of 2017, um, were other agents already at what I'm going to generally refer to, generally refer to as the Orchard or Fitzgerald Farms? Yes. And what were those other agents doing at Fitzgerald Farms? Attempting to locate uh, Tara's remains. Now, um, about what time of day did your interview with Ryan Duke take place? 12.52 p.m. Now you said 12.52 p.m. Is that when it ended or started? Started. And the Fitzgerald Police Department, how, uh, when Ryan walked into the Fitzgerald Police Department, was he put in handcuffs? It was a civil police department, but... Sorry. <laughs> no, he was not placed in handcuffs. Now, for those who may not have been inside the Osceola Police Department, can you explain to them what, when person, when just persons off the street walk into the Osceola Police Department, um, what area are they standing in? They're standing in like a little foyer area with a partition of glass or plexiglass with a window with somebody who's sitting behind it. Um, and there are a couple of doors, um, access doors to allow to go to the back of the department, other areas of the department beyond that little entrance way that are locked generally. Um, how long do you, can you tell us, were Ryan and his mother at the police department before you actually began the interview itself? Five or six minutes. Did anyone else come with Ryan other than his mother? Stepfather. When you did begin the interview with Ryan, did that occur out in the part you just discussed that's for the general public or somewhere else? No. Um, I went out to the that little foyer area, opened that little access door, walked out, um, exchanged some pleasantries, thank you for coming, walked into the back of okay. the, um, to where the interview room is actually located inside of the police department. And again, for those who've not been in the police department or that portion of the police department, how far is that foyer area to the interview room? Not very far. I would say probably from myself to the, the bar you're standing right behind. Okay. Um, and any doors that had to be unlocked, um, any bars in the way, or anything that kept you from making the walk just directly to it? No, there's a, there's a conference room, like a little training area conference room that you walk through. It's just an, a big open room as you yes. come through that first door. And then the interview room that we use is directly in line of sight from the first door that we entered. You can actually look at that door and then walk straight through. Okay. And the door from... If you're in the back part of the police department where the employees are, if you want to get out of that part to go into the foyer area, can you do that? I mean, do you have to have a key to do that or can you just unlock the door yourself and walk through? If you're already in the accessed area behind that, you can pretty well access. And I mean, there are other office doors that can be locked. Yes, sir. Um, that other officers have their special offices, the chief's office, the investigator's offices, the patrol room. Those doors can be locked. Yes, um, sir. Most of the time that, that, that I've been there, most of the time those doors are open usually. Okay. And I, I guess more specifically, at any point um, when, or I guess in the beginning, when Ryan was in that interview room before that interview began, um, and even into the first few minutes of that interview, um, if Ryan had wanted to leave, could he have done that? Yes. Would you have had to open any doors or unlock any doors to let him out? I would have escorted him from outside the interview room back to the same foyer door that he could have, but he, he could have walked out yeah, okay. without having to unlock him or anything like that. And, and that's my point. He wasn't locked in. No. Um, any, and again, any bars, any, you know, cell doors, anything keeping him there at that point? No. Were, um, in the beginning, at that, uh, before you left the police department, was he ever placed in handcuffs? No, he was never placed in handcuffs um, at the police department. At the police department. So when you, when he comes back there, do you want to come back into the room with him other than yourself? Agent Holland. And Agent Holland, with, um, because we do have two that they may hear Holland. about, Madison Holland. 
Now, um, this interview room, does it have a built-in camera system that you're aware of? There is one, yeah. Did you utilize or turn on that built-in camera system? No. Did you, however, record the interview that you had with him? Yes. Um, and in, initially, what sort of recording device did you use to record that interview? A uh, digital recorder, small black digital recorder. Uh, did Mr. Duke, that being this defendant, know that you were recording the interview with him? He did. Did you try to hide the recording device or hide it from him that he was being recorded? No. Now, at some point during the interview, before Mr. Duke began speaking, I'm going to change this, did you read him what we commonly refer to as Miranda right at the very beginning of the interview? I did not. However, at some point into the beginning of that interview, did you stop the interview and then advise him of his Miranda rights? I did. Um, and in what way did you advise him of his Miranda rights? We have a Miranda form, a consent form um, that contains his Miranda rights. We filled it out or filled it out right there in front of him and then would have gone over his rights with him. Um, he would have signed it and we would have continued on with the interview, which is what we did. Okay. Um, I do. How do you recognize that? This is the waiver of rights Miranda form that I filled out and went over with Mr. Duke during his interview. And is that the original form that you went over with Mr. Duke? It is. Then any changes to that form since the time that you interviewed Mr. Duke back in 2017? Other than the stamping of the case number at the bottom. Okay. Um, at the time that you interviewed, read, no, never mind, that's a different form. Um, Any objection? No objection. 176 is completed without objection. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.
Um, why did you have Mr. Duke initial each right in his own handwriting? Just verifying that those are the rights that we covered together, um, just acknowledging that those are the rights that we read to him. Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier, and perhaps I, I'm missing it on this form, but you mentioned earlier something about drugs and alcohol. I do. Um, is there any place on this form where it asks about drugs or alcohol use? No. Okay. So what did you mean when you said drugs and alcohol earlier? Um, I asked him whether or not he was under the influence of any alcohol or drugs prior to the interview. And what was his response? He said that he had taken a pain pill earlier that morning. Now again, what time of day is it when you're filling out this form itself? 12.57 p.m. Did you ask him, based on the fact that he told you he had taken a pain pill, if he felt like that was affecting his ability to think or process? I did ask him that. What was his response? He said he fully understood what we were there, what was going on, and that he agreed to provide, continue to provide a statement that he was, um, I'd say, it's not the exact word, sound mind body. He acknowledged that he was aware of what was going on. He was fully willing to cooperate. Okay. Uh, no. Or it didn't, it didn't impede his judgment or something to that effect. Uh, again, was all of this recorded? It is recorded. When you mentioned earlier, when I used the wrong date, about 2005, that you were working, I think, at the Thomas County Sheriff's Department? I was. Is that Thomas County here in Georgia? It is. Um, how long did you work at the Thomas County Sheriff's Department? Um, I worked there from July of, two, or excuse me, July of 1999 to August of 2007. Um, and in what capacities did you work for the Thomas County Sheriff's Department? Um, I started in the jail. I worked as a jailer. I then became certified as a law enforcement officer in 99. Um, I worked in our civil division. I worked as a school resource officer. I worked as a patrol officer and as an investigator. When you were working in the jail, ever have an occasion to um, interact with someone who was under the influence of alcohol? Yes. Ever had to um, occasion in, interact with someone who was just plain drunk? Yes. Um, what about folks who had taken drugs? I believe so, yes. Um, and what about folks who had taken drugs to the point that they were just out of it? I've definitely seen that. Um, what about on the road when you're working as a patrol officer? Ever have an occasion to interact with someone who was so intoxicated they couldn't drive safely? Yes. Um, and in fact, as an officer, just initially as, as a patrol officer when you became post certified, do you receive some training as it relates to how to identify persons who are impaired in some way? Yes. Now, tell me again how long you were on the road? Um, I, I started working I started in the jail from July till about October, went to the police academy till December. I worked the civil division um, from January of 2000 until uh, school started that fall, which would have been about August. I worked in school resource for about three years. Um, in between times of working school resource officer, when there were breaks from school, I would then go and assist the investigations division, conducting investigations, helping them with investigations. Um, after three years on school resource, I uh, went back to the patrol division for about a year and then an investigator's position opened and I applied and got the investigator's position. And so from about 2004 till 2007, I finished as an investigator. Fair to say that in most of your jobs with the Sheriff's Department in Thomas County that you would have been interacting with persons who were either under the influence of alcohol or some sort of drug? Yes. Um, and then again, once you became a GBI agent, um, just because you're not working the road anymore, does that mean you stop interacting with people who are drunk? No. Does that mean you stop interacting with people who've been using drugs? No. Um, and as part of your training and your experience in doing this job, um, have you been trained um, to see the indications or signs of someone who is impaired? Yes. Um, and to be fair, can people um, take drugs without necessarily being impaired? Yes. Um, understanding the defendant told you he had taken a pain pill, um, in your observations of him that day, did you observe anything that would indicate to you that he was in any way impaired by that pain pill? No, absolutely not. And again, um, well, I'm just going to have you ever taken a pain pill? Yes. Um, do you find that at some point that pain pill, the effects of it start to wear off? Yes. Um, again, do you have any idea how early that morning it was that the defendant took that pain pill? I do not. Uh, 
But when you were interviewing him, nearly one o'clock. Yes. So, um, at any point, and then how long that particular day? How long do you interact with the defendant? Approximately four hours. Any point during those four hours, did you see him behave in a manner in which um, he appeared not to understand what was going on? No. At any point, did you notice anything about, let's say, his speech that appeared slurred? No. Anything about him that indicated he did not understand the rights you were advising him of? No. Anything about his demeanor that he did not? I just object to leading. I don't know why, but I don't object to leading questions. Was there anything about his demeanor that led you to believe? I was going to Anything about his demeanor that led you to believe that he was not aware of the seriousness of the charges or the seriousness of this investigation? Absolutely not. Um, from the time that you read him these rights and he told you he had taken the pain pill until the three to four hours later when you are no longer around him, did you see any changes in him that would have led you to believe that perhaps he was coming off of a pain pill or the side effects were being reduced? Objection, I will objection. No. Um, now, the interview in the beginning, I think you said this, it was audio recorded. It was initially. Have you had an occasion to listen to that particular interview recently? Yes. And when is the last time that you listened to that interview? Yesterday. Show you the counsel that Mark State's Exhibit 177. Sure. I'm going to show you what's in Mark State's Exhibit 177. Okay. Do you recognize State's 177? I do. Um, how do you recognize State's 177? Sure. State's Exhibit number 177 is a uh, DVD disc um, containing the uh, audio recordings of the interview with Ryan Duke that were I generated from my digital recorder. Wow. Um, and specifically, what was again? What was the date of that interview? February the twenty second. And the disc that you're holding in your hand, how do you know that that's the disc that you've watched recently? I, I, listened to recently. I initialed it. Um, that particular disc is that a true and accurate recording of the interview you did with Mr. Duke in the beginning, before the videos were not, on um, February twenty second of two thousand seventeen. It is. All right. This time, I would tender to edit states. Exhibit All right, any objection or board I guess okay. it's authenticity. Thank you. That's admitted without objection. Page 177. And just, Matt, just a moment to rearrange things a little bit. Sure. Ms. Lee, if you'll help us, thank you. Ms. Lee, if you'll help us, thank you. I'm good for right now, sir.
Having been there that day, um, can you tell the jury why it is that Mr. Duke is so much lower than you are? Just his tone of voice. Um, the recorder is probably a little closer to me as well. Um, it's on the table almost directly in front of me. Um, and so where he's sitting would have, it, like a triangle, I'm sitting here. Agent Holland is across the desk from me. And then Mr. Duke was on this end of the table. So the recorder would have been generally in front of me. So, he, you know, and he was kind of turned, cantered slightly towards me, not versus, not directly looking at the not 100% directly looking towards the recorder, speaking at the recorder. Thank you. Yes. 
Santa. Okay. Okay. You went to her house. How did you get into her house? Uh, it's easy. You uh, park a dead bolt. You can pop a lock real easy. I mean, I broke into people. I never steal more than 20 bucks. I mean, right. just I'm proud of it. You know, I, I know this is just poor. Telling me is is information. I'm and I keep. I want you to keep talking to me. Just, but because of where we're going with this, I'm, I'm, I know that you've never been in real major trouble before. I, I understand. I'm going to prison. Probably. And I'm not I'm saying that. Lot. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, to moving forward, I want to make you aware of your rights. I, I have to. I waive my right to a lawyer. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to read that form to you and let you do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Sit down. 
did you get there? Uh, I, that's what I have a hard time remembering because I've been drinking and I don't even remember getting in a car. Do you remember, was this like after midnight? This is pretty late. It was pretty late. It was like I passed out from drinking. Do you remember any animals in the house or outside of the house? No, sir. Okay. Uh, so probably, if you took this truck, you probably drove over there. Yes, sir. Do you remember where you parked out around in there? Just on the same street? I don't even know. I mean, I... And why her? Of all the people, why her?
bedroom, right? And I'm going to give you my notepad. And 
you if you can. It's just completely up to you to write down how you feel about this. And I want you to put down if, if, as if you were talking to maybe her family or something like that or, or anybody. Would you have a problem doing that?
few questions. Now, after what we just heard, Agent Shadow, actually during what we just heard, um, we heard you talking about, um, I don't know if you said cotton swabs or you said something about his mouth. Um, what were you doing at that point? Obtaining sample of his DNA. And um, prior to this interview, did you have a search warrant for his DNA? I did. Um, and again, that particular sample of his DNA, was it submitted to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab? It was. And what was the purpose of submitting um, the defendant's DNA to the crime lab? To compare it to the glove that we collected um, at our residence during the inception of the investigation. Okay. Now, um, I believe, did we hear you say something about that you were going to set up a video? Yes. All right, so I guess let me ask you then, why did you, if you had the capability of a video camera, why did you not set that up to begin with? Um, I really didn't know what we were going to get based on the initial interview. Usually I just use a recorder. Um, I then decided to set up a video to then document it, his demeanor, everything, even further with a video just to support what we'd already talked about again. So just like a secondary, like a backup. And, and I think you said this, but I want to clarify. Generally, the GBI's policy, do you video or audio record um, your interviews? We try to, yes. So, video or audio or both? Both. Combination. But it could be either one. Okay. Uh, most of my interviews, I would say, throughout the course of my history as an agent and as an investigator, are usually just audio recorded. Um, and I guess to, to be fair, when you walked into the interview that day, did you expect what was going to happen within those first few seconds? No. Okay. Um, at the end there, we hear you, um, do we hear you ask him to write something for you? Yes, a written statement. Um, and did he agree to do that? He did. Opposing counsel, it's been Martin State's Exhibit 181. I'm sure you it's been Martin State's Exhibit 181 and asked you, do you recognize that? I do. Um, how do you recognize that? Um, I was very, this is the, um, it's got my signature on it as well with my badge number. Um, this is the actual written statement that Mr. Duke provided after I asked him to. And is this the original statement that the defendant provided to you on that date? It is. Now, um, you just mentioned your signature on, well, I guess let me ask you this first. Judge, at this time I have a tender and evidence states exhibit 181. All right, no. Ms. Virtue, any objection? No objection. Thank you. That's admitted without objection. States 181. Okay, I that yes. Okay. Now, looking at States 181, uh, let me ask you first. You mentioned your signature. Is your signature on this document? It is. And uh, where is your signature? Right above the date. Okay. Um, who wrote the date? Um, I think I had him write the date. Okay. Other than your signature in this 156, uh, the remainder of the writing, whose writing is that? Brian's. And um, this, I guess, uh, stamp that's at the bottom, who put that stamp there? I did. Was that before or after he wrote the statement? After. Other than that stamp, this statement completely as it was on February 22nd of 2017? It is. Okay. Um, the part where we where we I stopped the um, audio portion. Did you turn your video? Off? Yes. And do we have that video itself? Yes. Showing opposing counsel to Martin State's Exhibit 182. Have you had a chance to view that video recently? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been Martin State's Exhibit 182 and ask you if you recognize that. Stakes Exhibit Number 182 is a uh, DVD disc containing that interview, the video interview portion um, that we're describing now. How do you know that specific disc is the one that contains this interview? It's got my initials on it. 
where I initialed seeing it. Um, and when you have watched this video, is it a true and accurate depiction of the interview that took, the remainder of this interview that took place on February 22nd, 2017? It is. No, no, at this time we would tender it over State's Exhibit 182. We have no objection. 182 is admitted without objection. Thank you. And we would seek to publish that to the jury. How long is this? Um, this one is at probably, Judge, only 20 to 30 minutes. It's the next one that's very long. All right, 20 minutes. So, all right, let's take a uh, reset. Okay. Uh, sounds like a kind of an urgent reset. Uh, it'll take about five or 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. If y'all will adjourn to the jury room, we'll be right back with you. Thank you. There goes the game.
All right, everybody ready to proceed? Ms. Hart? Okay. All right, Mr. Deere, join us, please. Uh, Hart, you can proceed. Thank you. May I actually publish the original cut of the original round that made the state's exhibit 181? Sure. <laughs>
Sunday, so I'm going to get you signed as well, okay? And uh, I just have a couple of requests. Before each, like right here, and here at the end, put your initials so nobody can go in and put anything else there. And uh, would you sign that uh, date it too? And it's uh, February 22nd, 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017.
use like a Wi-Fi and can't go from your parents' house? Yeah, well, I don't know. Okay. Okay. But there's not going to be like a book, like a book, you never kept any newspaper article or anything like that? You were kind of trying to distance yourself from it the whole time? Sick and oblivious. I mean, the...
watch the video from not quite as good as your audio from your CD correct this is coming from the computer and the okay. camera itself which is on the other side of the table um, however um, do you recall specifically this interview that you did with the defendant I do okay. just a couple things that I want to talk with you about um, specifically um, you asked him some questions about whether or not someone had ever confronted him about murdering Miss Grinstead who was that person you were asking about I'm sorry. You asked him um, once or more than one time throughout that interview if someone back in 2005 had ever confronted him about whether or not he killed Miss Grinstead. Correct. Who was the person you were talking about asking if that person confronted him? Um, it would have been law enforcement primarily. I'm, okay. Anybody from law enforcement um, uh, would have been my primary okay. asking for that. Um, do you know um, who all was living, based on what the defendant told you, who was living at the residence with the defendant back in 2005 when this murder occurred? Um, if I recall, he said um, it was he, himself, uh, Bo, and maybe Stephen on and off, his brother. That was going to be my question. And do you, Stephen is, what is his relationship to the defendant? That's his brother, Stephen Duke. And to your knowledge, um, did you ask the defendant if Stephen had ever confronted him? Yes. Okay. Um, the, and I think you've just said this, but when we hear you and the defendant referencing Bo in this interview, who is the person the two of you are discussing? Oh, you have to read that again. It's a lot. When we he sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm trying not to sit on top of people over here, too. When we hear you and the defendant discussing someone by the name of Bo, Right. Who is that person? Who was Bo? Bo is, Dukes. Okay. Just want to be clear that we're talking about the same person. Yes. Um, and as it relates to um, what the defendant indicated he did, um, there were times that, it, again, it's kind of difficult to hear, so I want, what did he tell you about it back then? Um, do you recall what, how he said her body got from the house to the truck? He took it out there. He... He actually made the motion during the interview when he put his hands up like this, kind of mimicking how he actually held her body. Um, and I know you're not able to see the video that we've just seen, so do you have a recollection of that from that day? I do. Um, and do you recall if he had any reaction himself as he was mimicking holding her body? Yeah, I think, and you've heard it on the video, I think as, as he's doing that, he's, he kind of started getting emotional and started... I think he said, and she was so small, referring to her size in his own. Um, now, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk to you about something we refer to as guilty knowledge. Can you tell the jurors um, what we mean by guilty knowledge? Sure. Guilty knowledge is the facts of an investigation that the only people who know of that would be the person or persons who committed the actual act 
because they were there at the time and generally law enforcement because we have investigated we have found out these leads we don't release a lot of that information we try to keep that information in-house so when we actually talk to somebody who was involved they're able to give us some of those details that only the person or persons who committed the crimes will have known about in this particular case when you became the lead agent was it 2009 2009 um, did you become familiar with any guilty knowledge that had been held back in this case yes a couple of facts yes and what were those facts um, the first one was um, on the glove. We talked about the that there was a unknown DNA, male DNA on the glove. We talked about that openly, but what we never disclosed early on was that Tara's DNA was also on the glove. So that was a specific fact that how do we know that that glove was connected to Tara? Well, Tara's DNA was on it. We knew that, but we didn't release that initially. The second is a telephone call that was made to Tara's house the morning of the that Sunday morning. There was a 411 call made to her house. Um, other agents, this is before I had become involved in the investigation. I had learned this from other agents who had worked on the investigation. They disclosed to me after I became the case agent about um, that particular phone call. That was a 411 call made to her residence um, uh, from a pay phone at the G&G store. So I knew of that phone call and I know that that phone call, the, the 411, the store was used I know that that was never made public to anyone throughout the course of the investigation. There may have been a handful of people at our office who actually even knew about that. Okay. Um, and what store, uh, well I guess let me ask you first, when you were speaking with the defendant specifically as to any phone calls that were made, okay. to be fair, when you first asked him if he made any phone calls, did he deny that? I don't, at first I think he kind of said maybe he did and then he yeah yeah and then he i said well i know there were some phone calls because i i came back and i said i know there were some phone calls made okay. i just never disclosed the specifics of the phone call so that was my next question at any point prior to what we were able to hear and see did you ever tell ryan duke about a phone call being made to tara's residence from a payphone no did you ever tell ryan duke about a phone call being made to tara's residence in which someone used directory assistance or 411? No. Um, after you indicated to him that you knew there were some phone calls made that morning, um, and to be fair, was that 411 call the only phone call that was made to her residence that morning? No. Uh, but after you made that statement to him, was he able to give you details that formed guilty knowledge? Yes. And specifically, what were the details that you recall him giving you about that payphone, or excuse me, about that telephone call? The the location of the of the where the phone call was made, that right. it was made from a payphone, both of which we verified, and that he had used directory assistance or 411 at the time to make that phone call. And now you said the location of that, that payphone. Where was that payphone located from which the call was made in 2005? At the G&G store right here. Okay, and you're pointing, is that just less than a block right from direction. here yes right next to pex okay. so restaurant uh, and was the defendant able to indicate to you that the phone call he made that morning to her residence was from that location he did and um, did he ever tell you why he made that phone call to her location he did what did he tell you about that he said that uh, he called to uh, in his words, I think he wanted her to answer the phone or somebody to answer the phone, like her to answer the phone, that she would not actually be dead. Um, and then um, nobody answered the phone, and then he went directly to the house. Okay. Um, and I believe towards the end of maybe the audio, um, we hear you asking him questions about, is this the person that we've been talking about that you killed? Um, what were you doing at that point on the audio? We can't see it. What were you doing? Um, to show him something. I had pictures of Tara, for instance, that I showed him. And I will show you specifically on the screen in front of you what's been previously entered as States 135. Do you recall if a copy of this picture is one of the pictures you showed him? Yes. And when you showed him those pictures, what was his response about whether or not this was the person that he killed back in 2005? He identified that being the person that he killed. Now, um, 
Throughout the course of this interview, did you recall the defendant telling you how exactly he killed Tara Grinstead? He said that he hit her. And um, do we later on hear you trying to, I guess, flesh that out about how that occurred? Correct. Um, one time we even hear you kind of make a somewhat of a joke, like part of you make, about him not being the Hulk. Can Correct. you explain to the jury the purpose of continuing to ask questions about that? Sure. At the time that he's saying that he struck her, he's saying he struck her the one time um, during the interview, he said he struck her and that's what killed her. And so you can hear during the audio and in the video when I'm asking him to describe, I'm not saying that that's not possible, that that couldn't happen. It absolutely can. He was in the military. He's got military training at the time that, that all that happened. I'm not saying that that wasn't the possibility, but trying to elaborate if there was other possibilities, other things that he had done, like choking or some other form or fashion that he had done to try to um, to kill Ms. Grinstead. Okay. Um, and to be clear, um, when he told you that he hit her, um, what part of his body did he indicate he had used to hit her, either through words or through motions or... Without benefit of looking at the video, I, I, I'm pretty certain he made, he, he talked about his hand. I know he talked about okay. his hand several okay. times. I can't remember if he made a motion gesture with his fist or anything, but I know he said his hand. I, I know that sounds kind of like a silly question, but I just want to make sure I mean, he wasn't saying he headbutted her or anything of that Correct. nature. Correct. Correct. Um, now, let's talk about the glove, because you mentioned earlier that the glove was a, a form of guilty knowledge. By the time that you um, interviewed the defendant, would you agree that it was pretty well known that a glove had been found? Yes. What about the fact that a glove had been found and de at least one unknown male's DNA had been found on the glove? Yes. And when I say widely known, I mean not by the GBI, I mean by anybody who knew about this case. Right. There were several um, television shows, broadcast shows that had um, broadcast stories about the Grand State case um, throughout the years. Um, uh, yeah. I I'm almost certain that they even maybe disclosed towards the end there about the Tara's DNA being okay. on there as well. However, in many of those news stories, um, did they have an opinion about what color the glove was? Over the the, the TV shows? Yes. Um, no, because there was a, I'm pretty certain there was a picture of it, but there were other times where other gloves were mentioned okay. that were found in the area. For instance, during the podcast, do you remember, well, are you familiar with the podcast in this case? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with whether or not during the podcast there was talk, all this talk about a blue glove? Yes. Um, and in fact, have there been over the years pictures of a blue glove displayed? Yes. Um, to your knowledge, in this investigation, was the glove that was collected from Tara Grinstead's home ever blue? No. Okay. Um, so in talking to the defendant, did you ask him what color the glove was that he brought to her residence? I did. And what did he tell you, do you recall? He said it was a translucent or clear colored glove. Okay. Um, the fact that he knew what color glove had been located at her home, is that something that you took notice of? Yes. And further, did he tell you why he owned those types of gloves? Yes, he said that they had uh, cats at his house and he used the gloves to change the cat litter. Okay. Um, now, the defendant's brother, Stephen Duke, um, do you know what he does for a living? I do not. Okay. Um, do you, so you don't know where he works? I don't. Okay, that's fine. So, um, and to be clear, did the defendant, when did the defendant indicate he brought the glove to Tara's home? He said he brought the gloves after he killed her. He said he killed her, then left the house in a rush, went back to his house to gather a quilt and the gloves to then come back to the crime scene, which is, again, when he made the phone call on his way back to the house and then went to the house. Okay. Um, towards the end of the video portion, we um, hear you discussing going out there or him taking you somewhere. Where is it that you wanted him to go with you? The orchard where they dumped the body, where he dumped the body the first time, and then they took the body to the secondary location. Okay. Um, and before I move on, let, let's talk about that. The information that you just said, where he dumped the body and then they took it to a secondary location. Can you tell us what you mean by that from what Ryan Duke told you? Sure. He said when he took her out to the orchard, he put her into the actual, into the pecan orchard. Um, and that, that the body stayed there for several days before they went back out, he and Bo went back out there to the 
orchard and then he that's when Bo found out and saw the body for the first time and then they moved the body from there together to the deeper into the woods to the pine tree area then went back to the shed and got the loads of wood um, from the shed that was located just near the entrance as you go in and then proceeded to burn the body. Um, based on what Ryan Duke told you, um, did Bo Dukes ever go to Tara Grinstead's residence? No. Um, based on what Ryan Duke told you, when did Bo Dukes become involved in this conspiracy? He, well, he said he told him Sunday when he got back to the house that he had killed her. He said Bo didn't believe him. Yes, sir. And then he told him again. The investigation had been going on at that time for several days, and he and Bo conversated again. I think it was that Wednesday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That Wednesday is the day they went back out to the orchard. Okay. Um, and the orchard that we've been discussing, is that located in Irwin County? No, it's in Fitzgerald, Ben Hill County. Okay. Um, did you personally charge Bo Dukes with any crimes related to his actions in burning Tara Grinstead's body? I did. And um, off your hand, off hand, do you recall what those crimes were that you charged Bo Dukes with? Concealing death. Um, and are those charges against Bo Duke still pending? They are. Now, um, the orchard that we've heard about from the defendant and that we talked about um, earlier that belonged to Randy Hudson, did the defendant agree to go with you out there that day? He did. Um, after the video was turned off in this interview, is there a second recording, both audio and video, of the defendant? Yes. Um, when does the second interview, I'm going to call it a second interview, okay. um, but the audio portion, why did you turn the audio back on at that point? Well, um, I came back in because um, I had left the room after the, I had gone, after that initial video cuts off, I leave the room. I then start making some phone calls to the agents that were at the location. They, there was already agents out there um, at the orchard area, near that orchard area. I was letting my boss know what was going on. Um, advising him of everything that had just happened took place we're getting ready to come out there um, I had some administrative paperwork that still needed to be completed um, and so I was out of the room at that point in time then when I came back in the room we started the recorder again um, just the audio recording and I knew we were getting ready to leave and get in my car and drive so it was there was no capability of having further video going on um, from my computer that we were doing the actual interview with yes and so um, turned the recorder back on, completed some of the administrative paperwork that we did. At that point, we got in my vehicle and myself, um, Brian and Agent Holland, Madison Holland. Yes, sir. And then we drove together to the orchard um, in Fitzgerald. Okay. Um, you say that after the this video that we just watched was turned off, that you left the room. Do you recall if Agent Madison Holland also left the room or if he stayed in there with Bo Dukes? With Ryan? Uh, I mean, with Ryan. I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember, honestly. Okay. I don't remember if he stayed. He, he may have stayed in for a few minutes and maybe back and forth. I think we may have both been in and out okay. in that area. Um, so I want to talk about the audio portion we listened to just a minute before we go into the second audio. In the beginning, um, why did you not immediately advise Mr. Duke, Ryan Duke, of these Miranda rights that we talked about earlier and that we heard you? He wasn't in custody. Okay. And some point, well, let me ask this first. We talked about that prior to you reading Miranda rights, was he there voluntarily and free to go? Yes. Um, at the point where you read Miranda, why have you chosen to stop and read Miranda at that specific point? Because he wasn't going to be free to leave at that okay. point. And why was that? Because he had just confessed to murdering Miss Greenstein. Okay. Um, and throughout the interview, um, does Mr. Duke make statements to you um, that acknowledge the fact that he knows that he's not free to leave anymore essentially yes okay um, so let's talk about when you turn the audio back on you talked about you had some administrative paperwork to do mm -hmm. can, can you tell the jury what that was arrest i think it's the arrest record okay um, and again that was audio recorded it is have you had a chance to listen to that audio recently yes Show 
with opposing counsel. It's the Martin Estates Exhibit 185. Agent Chabelle, I'm going to show you what I marked the state's exhibit 185. Ask you to take a look at that for me, please. Sure. Okay. Do you recognize what 185 is? I do. And how do you recognize 185? Um, I recognize it because I'm the one that created this. This is a copy, a DVD copy of the that second audio recording with Ryan um, dated and timed. Okay. With my initials on it. That's going to be my question. So, um, is this a true and accurate recording of that second audio with Ryan Duke? It is. Okay. Showing opposing counsel about Mark State's Exhibit 186. Should have done this at the same time, sorry. To show you what's the Martin Six Exhibit 186, do you recognize that? I do. How do you recognize that? Um, this is a DVD copy uh, of the video that was created um, with Ryan and myself going out to the orchard. Okay. Um, and how do you know that that's a true and accurate copy, or how do you know that disc is the disc that you're talking about? I viewed it and then initialed the disc itself. Okay. Um, and is this disc a true and accurate recording of the video that was taken at the orchard? Yes. Um, now, this particular video, did you take it yourself? I did not. Okay. Um, but are you actually in the video? Yes. Um, as it relates to State's Exhibit 185, the audio recording, does it continue running while the video recording, State's Exhibit 186, is also running? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, so, at some portion, are these, both 186 and 185, going to be overlapping as far as content? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, at this time I would seek to publish 185, um, but I would say that there's probably a good stopping point where we could stop when they get in the vehicle if we're going to need a break or take lunch because it is rather long. How long is 185? Uh, 185 is two hours. All right, but there's a good break point yes, after how long? Um, I'd say about 25, 30 minutes. All right, we've got about 25 minutes of audio. Does anybody need a break before we launch into that? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any objection to 185? No objection, thank you. All right, that's submitted without objection. And I apologize, I forgot. I said 185 and 186. I would see to it. Any objection to no, 186? No, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Norton, yes. Do you need some water? I've got some, thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrapped up in the cords if I do it by myself. Thank you. Perfect. I got a small audio. Yeah. Yeah, we have that backed up just a little bit. It looks like it's. Okay. It might already be in your lap.